Jesus often told those whom he healed not to tell anyone. Why would he not want his fame to spread? The master made answer in words true and plain, ye must be born again. Good morning, and welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode of the podcast, we continue our study of the gospel according to Mark. We'll begin in Mark chapter 1, verse 29, and go through chapter 2 and verse 13. The purpose of this series of the podcast is to prepare for our sermon series on the gospel according to Mark, the book of the month for January 2023. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Let's get into the study. Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. Simon's mother-in-law healed. Jesus continues his miracles as he ministers to the people of Galilee. He next goes to the home of Simon, who will be renamed Peter a little later where Simon's mother-in-law is lying sick with a fever. Jesus raised her up, taking her by the hand. Take note of that. It's not in every account of miraculous healing, but in several of them, Jesus takes the hand of the formerly sick. As a matter of fact, the way Mark writes this says that in approaching her and taking her by the hand, he raised her up. But how can we say this was a miracle? Maybe she got better on her own. Maybe he gave her some traditional homeopathic remedy, and after a couple of days, she was all better. The way Mark tells it, though, in rapid succession, he raised her up, and the fever left her, and she literally was waiting on, or was serving them. The picture painted is of Peter's wife's mom getting up to immediately begin to continuously serve the guests in her home. She felt better, so what? Over the past almost three years, we have dealt with a virus that saps your energy for a few days even after your fever passes. Some claim the effects last weeks, months even. We've also heard how it is a common effect of many viri. Your body has expended a lot of energy to fix a problem, to neutralize a threat. You're going to need time to recover. Peter's mother-in-law didn't need that time. Chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. Multitudinous Miracles Note that here... Jesus' miracles are spoken of in a general way. On the one hand, Mark takes care to identify some people. On the other hand, he can't name everyone who was healed because I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. John chapter 21, verse 25. But one thing that Mark does mention, Jesus was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Again, we ought to ask why Jesus does not want this publicity. Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. Everyone is looking for you. The first thing that we ought to notice in these verses is Jesus prayed. The Son of God, the heir of all creation, humbled himself to the role of servant. He asked his Father for help, guidance, and everything else that we might ask for. We are only told of the content of one of his prayers, John 17. The others are secret, but Jesus makes sure to take time for prayer. He started early in the morning, while it was still dark. He went to a secluded place. We're not told how long Simon and his companions searched for him or what time it was when they found him, but find him, they did. Everyone is looking for you, they said. One would think that this would be a good way to spread your message. When people want to hear you, you can develop a following. You can be an influencer. That's the goal of many in our modern culture. But Jesus says, I've come to preach. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1, verse 15. It reminds me of something Paul would say later. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. The goal of the gospel is to be spread. It is to be taught. Those who hear it and desire to faithfully serve God must make the choice to obey it. There were people where Jesus was who were willing to hear him some more, or perhaps only to see the miracles that Jesus did. Were they sincere or merely seeking entertainment? Either way, they would make the choice to follow Christ 
or not. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. The untouchable touched. Jesus touched the most unclean of the unclean. Some of the rules of the law of Moses seem to often deal with stopping the spread of infectious diseases. Jesus, being born under the law, should have avoided this man like the plague. But whenever someone asked for help in various ways, Jesus obliged. I guess the better way to say it would be, whenever someone realized that Jesus was the only one who could help, he helped. It is also interesting that Jesus teaches here an aspect of the New Testament. To the pure, all things are pure, Titus 1 verse 15. It's not just about food, Mark chapter 7 verse 19. He touches the untouchable and remains clean. Another interesting take comes from John Chrysostom from the 4th century. The law is in his hands. The idea that the silver tongue puts forth is that Jesus actually didn't touch the unclean man, but as his hand approached the leper, the leprosy left him, and Jesus touched a newly cleansed man. Either way, Jesus commands him to show the priests and make the necessary offering. Jesus says this is how he wants the former leper to make it known. Don't tell anyone, but show the priests. Why was the offering to be made? Leviticus 14 goes through the process of being declared clean from the leprosy. There are several sacrifices that were made, and I wonder if the idea is to give thanks to God for the cleansing. But the former leper doesn't listen, and you can imagine that he can't help but rejoice at his cleansing and return to society. He can't help but give the Son of God the praise he deserves. Also, it is possible that his friends and family were asking him how he became clean. They would be almost as excited as he was to have their friend, father, husband, their son back among them. But this kept Jesus from re-entering the city and out in the unpopulated area. It didn't keep people from coming to him, but it made it more difficult. Excursus, Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 45. Does Jesus want people to know? Before we go on to this next section, I want to go back and cover something that I may have failed to mention in the previous episode. In verse 25, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit with the imperative, Be silenced. Note again the passive voice. We see it again in today's episode, verses 32 through 34. We don't see Jesus kicking people out of Peter's mother-in-law's room, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. See chapter 5 and verse 40. In the case of the removal of unclean spirits, people recognize that Jesus had this great authority even in the spiritual realm. This was a marvelous proof of his authority, but it will be used against him later. Chapter 3 verse 22. This is one reason that is introduced to explain why Jesus wanted to be unknown. And there are other reasons that have been offered. Perhaps it was out of humility. Perhaps it was because of the irreputable source. Again, chapter 3 and verse 22. Perhaps it was because that would keep him from publicly entering a city, as we read in verse 45 here. But is there another possibility? A pattern that I'm reading is that Jesus wants humanity to know that he is the Son of Man, not just the Son of God, as we've talked about before. These instances show his divine power over the realm of the creation. He is the Son of God. He can save from sickness, death, evil spirits. But what about sin? You could be healed of a grave disease just to live your life as you always had before. Nothing changes. But Jesus came to save us from the just condemnation of a righteous God. He came to save us from our sins. Again, Jesus seems to stress this aspect of his life. He is the Son of Man. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. That's the theme I've chosen to help us think about the book of Mark. Jesus as the Son of Man. Hopefully I'll keep that in focus as we go through the study. We could see a change of focus near the end of chapter 8 slash the beginning of chapter 9, but Jesus, even after that, continues to emphasize this theme throughout the book. Again, it seems to me that Jesus being the Son of God was obvious to anyone who witnessed him. It's Jesus' role, though, as the Son of Man that people need to understand from his life. And in this story, this motif comes into full view. The scribes asked in their heart, Who can forgive sins but God alone? In this internal question, we find an interesting path to the proof of Jesus' divinity. First, Jesus hears and answers their internal reasoning. They didn't think this out loud. But this is why I say his response is interesting. He takes a jab at the fact that this was their doctrine, not God's. 1 Samuel 2 verse 25 says, 
If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. Yes, God does get between the offender and the offended in some way, but he still puts the responsibility of forgiveness on the offended. What if God is the one who's offended, though? Yes, on that point, we concede. God must be the one to forgive. But one may object, what is sin except an offense toward God? True, but look back at verse 1. He was at home. These guys had ripped the roof off of Jesus' family's house, it seems to me. Jesus was the plaintiff here. Jesus had the right to forgive. Of course, Jesus is God, so he'd have the right to forgive anyway. The third hit Jesus lands on them comes when he shows his power and authority, his deity. He could just say, I forgive you, and there'd be no proof. He could also tell the paralytic to get up and walk. If he didn't, then Jesus has no power. But if the man does jump up and walk out of the door he couldn't get through because of the crowd, on his own two feet that he couldn't use to get in to see Jesus anyway, then Jesus shows himself to be the Son of God with power and, being in the flesh, the Son of Man with authority to judge and to forgive sins. Chapter 2, verse 13. Keeping the main thing the main thing. I certainly do not say that considering Jesus as the Son of God is unimportant. Without that fact, His being the Son of Man means absolutely nothing. What we need to think about, though, is what does Jesus want to emphasize in His life? It seems that many times people really focused on the miracles. In John 6, verse 26, for instance, Jesus tells the people who are following him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They were asking what Jesus could do for them, not what they could do for Jesus. Even in Mark so far, when Jesus gains too much notoriety, he can't do what he needs slash wants to do. Today we read Jesus say, let's go somewhere else so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. So what does Jesus emphasize? He emphasizes his preaching and teaching. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus' teaching is the main thing. Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee. We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages. 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.